Okay, well, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for another segment of the irrigation training series. I'm Richard Restucia, Vice President of Water Management Solutions. And today we're gonna to be talking about something that uh, I really enjoy and that's gardening, but uh, more importantly, what you should be doing to your garden this fall to make sure that your garden in the spring looks its best and performs its best. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to plan that far ahead or a lot of times I might think, gee, I've got plenty of time till I have to get, uh, get in shape for spring. But, uh, but then what happens is uh, spring hits and there's lots of other things I want to do besides catch up from last year. So today I'm really excited. We have uh, Andy Bellingeri, National Sales Manager for Jane Irrigation. Uh, helping us with a fall landscape checklist. Now, Andy's a lot more than just the national sales manager for Jane. His background has been in horticulture. He's been involved in landscape and horticulture pretty much all his life. Uh, he's uh, got his degree in horticulture for from uh, BYU. He's worked at a uh, couple uh, large contractors, including Oh, a few years we spent together at Valley Crest. Um, Andy's run crews. He sold uh, he sold landscape maintenance. He, uh, he understands plants and uh, his trainings are very popular here at James. So uh, Andy, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here again. Thank you. So Andy, are you having much of a fall in uh, Las Vegas, right? This is your home, Las Vegas, uh, Arizona, or Las Vegas, Nevada. Do you get, get much of a fall there? Yeah. So, well, if what, what we call fall, I absolutely love um, is, is a lot of the, the long timers, old old timers here in in southern Nevada Las Vegas specifically you know October and November the reasons we put up with May June July August and, and parts of September um, we have beautiful fall temperatures in the 70s uh, typically in you know in the 70s no winds and, and in essence fall for us becomes a second spring and a lot of times the landscape acts like a second spring as well um, you know, summer, you know, we, we were talking earlier about roses, you know, the, the rose training I did in spring. I think I mentioned this on the webinar. My roses go through a dormant cycle in summer, and they, I think they would probably bloom all winter long, and they're starting to push new buds and, and, and blooming right now because these, you know, cooler air temperatures, warmer soil temperatures, it's, uh, it's stimulating new growth. Um, so yeah, we get we get a little bit of fall, but it's more like a pleasant spring. I think today's high is going to be in the low 80s, which is a, a little bit warm for us. Typically, we'd be in the uh, that's probably eight to ten degrees warmer. But um, I haven't had to turn the air conditioning on uh, in November yet, so <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> so that's a good thing, right? Um, your um, your power bill uh, thanks you. But yeah, um, yeah and I, it's it's weird in Southern California. We're the same way. I know that. Um, I look for Christmas to be the day in which I probably uh, have to rake my leaves for the last time in the fall, but also have a leaf fall right through to uh, to Christmas Day. Yeah, you know, it's interesting talking about that. I look at this picture I've got up on the screen, you know, ever since I was a little kid, fall was always one of my favorite times of year. I don't know if it had to do with uh, it was football season or the weather got cooler or um, I could go begging door to door for free candy and get, get some treats that I typically wasn't allowed to have. Um, I've always loved fall and I, I love this picture. I love, I love the changing of the leaves that, you know, that crisp air, the, the, you know, is this picture kind of encapsulates in my, in my mind, what fall looks like. We don't get fall like that around here. Um, but what's interesting, I'm looking at, uh, you know, a peach tree I've got in my backyard right now. These are starting to change a little bit. And a, a lace barked elm tree I have in the front yard is, is starting to uh, drop some leaves and, and change colors a little bit. But yeah, it's probably end of December, sometime in January, leaf drop is complete. And we'll, uh, we'll have maybe rows that don't quite look like this, but it's a, it's a lot of mess to clean up nonetheless. Yeah. And Andy, that... Uh... Uh, knocking on doors and getting candy. It only works one day of the fall. Uh, trust me, I've tried it. And that, uh, that's the only day it works. Oh, I got it. It's a story for another time. But when we were in uh, about second grade, we, did, we decided to test that theory. And we went knocking on doors and begging for candy. And a little old lady didn't have any candy, but she had some cough drops. And so she shared her cough drops with us. So 
Wow, that's uh, that's scaring a lot of parents right now all over the country. So, well, yeah, um, yeah, but uh, nonetheless, falls is a great time of year, and a lot of good things going on in the landscape this time of year, believe it or not, as well. Uh, so, it makes for uh, makes for an exciting time. Um, a lot of a lot of fun activities going on. Yeah. So, before we get started, Andy, I just want to remind everybody we have both the chat and the uh, Q&A open. So if you have some questions as Andy's going through, please uh, type them in there and I will get them to Andy when it's appropriate. So let's, uh, let's see what you got, Andy. Sounds good. Okay, so we'll go through. There is about uh, there's, uh, a handful of items we'll go through today, um, checklist items, and these are basics. And I would invite questions if, if people have you know, more in-depth questions, you wanna know more, my contact information will be on the last slide, my email address, my cell phone, you can call, text, email, uh, be happy to, to, to chat more. But these, these are kind of some, some, some basics, right? And the first one I'll start with is lawn maintenance. Um, and first and foremost, uh, aerating your lawn. Now, I know a lot of people who think springs, spring is the time to aerate. And um, I remember when I was living in, in Utah, going to college, um, you know, that's every spring I saw, you know, the uh, entrepreneurial kids running around with their, their aerator, making good money, aerating lawns. And I thought, you know, it's really not the best time to do it. Fall, in my opinion, is a great time. You've played on that grass all summer long, right? It's got compacted. So not only is aerating it going to open it up, but if you live in a climate, well, even, even here in Vegas, we don't necessarily get snow, maybe every few years a little bit, but we do get winter rains. By opening up that soil, opening up the pores, loosening it up, um, you love more moisture to get in. Um, so, you know, for, for it, those that live in snowy environments, um, you can um, get a lot of benefits of, of aerating in the fall versus the spring. Uh, not only does it have the traditional benefits of reducing compaction and, and, um, and uh, allowing the roots to grow better, it, it, it allows more moisture to come in. And, you know, it's interesting. I remember uh, a guy by the name of Dave Hansen I worked with at Valley Crest, and he was a, uh, I think it was UC Davis, but he was a, a very brilliant horticulturist. And he shared with me once a study that he had done at Davis where they had, uh, they had studied with, I think it was 24, within 72 hours of, of pulling these core, um, the core aerating samples, the entire core almost was filled with roots from the grass. Huh. And and in the, in the fall, and we'll, we'll touch on this a couple times, air temperatures are cooler in the fall, but the soil temperatures are warmer. So while the shoot growth may slow down a little bit because those cooler temperatures and shorter days, the root growth is still active. And so if you can, if you can get those roots growing and really getting as healthy as possible, you're going to have a much better and stronger and healthier turf come spring. And aerating is one of the, the key things you can do to improve the health. Hey, Andy, can, uh, can most of us aerate our own lawns? I mean, I don't have an aerator, but I can go rent one, right, at a uh, at, uh, big box store for about 50 bucks for half a day, but can most of us do it? Yeah, you can rent one. You can use a spade, uh, your, your standard garden um, uh, fork, uh, four-tong fork. That's, that's how I do my backyard. I've got one of those, and it's only, you know, it's about, you know, 500 square feet or so of, of lawn area that, uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time, but um, you can either rent a machine like you're seeing here, a core aerator, um, or you can just use tines like you'd have on a, 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 a like a digging fork uh, you use in your garden. Yeah, I've got some clay soil now, so I'm using the, the kind that actually removes the plug. Yeah. Uh, so I don't get any additional compaction and, and uh, boy, I, I'm looking forward to spring to see how it works out. Yeah, you know, and if you have a slope, um, and you want to uh, reduce runoff and puddling, especially in the rainy season. Aeration is a good way to do that as well. Helps you know that the soil uh, absorb more water. So, um, good, good benefits with 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 that. And that kind of gets into the, uh, you know, the 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 next thing here with with your lawn maintenance in the fall. Um, again, touch on this this point that warm soil, warmer soil, and cooler air is is great time and uh you know for, for turf maintenance but opening up um the soil a little bit and then coming back with a fertilizer application especially something that's formulated you know this is scott's turf builder fall lawn food 
I haven't seen the back of this bag, but my guess is it's probably high in, in, in uh, the P, that's the middle number, you know, NPK, right? Um, that middle number or P is what encourages a good root growth. growth. So if you had a good balanced fertilizer or something that had, um, um, you know, some of that, uh, you know, good, good levels of uh, potassium will be good on, uh, on, on uh, fertilizer getting into the winter. And it's just, it's about building root strength, right? You wanna improve root strength. Now, a rule of thumb, especially in the Southwest, I think this is probably true throughout the, the country, but if you can be green, if your grass is green going into dormancy, winter dormancy, it'll stay green throughout the fall and winter. Now, I know some of you are in climates, uh, Richard, like Southern California, where it probably doesn't go dormant. You have a, it's a 12 month growing cycle, but other areas where you get some of those cooler temperatures, um, uh, that the cool season grasses will go dormant as well. But with a, uh, if you can get it green before that dormancy, it typically uh, will stay green throughout. And I know uh, in Las Vegas areas, it's probably true in Phoenix, other parts of uh, desert Southwest, that the, the last application of the fall, that the rule of thumb has always been by Thanksgiving, get a, get a fertilizer application on, that'll help you stay green throughout um, the, the rest of the fall and winter. Yeah, it's interesting. I've seen a trend uh, starting in some of the hotter areas like uh, Las Vegas or Phoenix, uh, where, I, where I grew up, and that is this uh, concept of keeping your lawn green during the winter and letting it go brown in the summer. Uh, this way, you know, a lot of people are, you know, liking being in a nice climate in the wintertime. And when the summer, it's too hot to be out enjoying your lawn anyway. So why not stop watering it then? Uh, save, save some water and, and, uh, and green it up for the winter. Yeah. And the key there is your turf type. If you have a warm season grass like Bermuda, it'll be green in the summer. And, uh, you know, once it gets below about 70 degrees, um, it's going to go dormant. But if you have a cool season grass, these are your fescues, you know, bluegrass. Um, they they can they can handle the, the cool season, you know, by their nature. And you can you can let them go dormant in the summer if you want. That's a that's a uh, nifty little concept. But yeah, the cooler temperatures, people enjoy being outdoors a little bit more. Yeah. So, um, a couple other things when it comes to your lawn mowing. You know, typically you're you know you're going to slow down on the mowing. And I heard somebody say, well, you got to mow it short. And, and I, I thought, you know, and I had heard that before and I, you know, is it like, a, I could maybe understand that in the spring, if you're going to mow short and rejuvenate and maybe add some, you know, overseed and some stuff. And, and I found somebody who said, well, no, they like that. They like to mow it short because it doesn't hold onto the leaves as much and it makes it easier to pick up the leaves. Um, otherwise, raising the height of your of your mower deck is gonna I think it'd be better for the uh, the, the lawn the longer roots and uh, typically what we that's what we want to see is is raising raising the deck on uh, on mowing so I just wanted to mention that and then the other thing with mowing if you're not using a mulching mower you got to do it. Um, it a blade of grass is something like eighty percent water and nitrogen I mean it is uh, it, it's a, it's a great way to keep your lawn lawn healthy reduces landfill. Uh, reduces time and just it's overall a, a healthier way to manage your grass and um, a lot of people say oh but I don't want to the thatch right I'm getting the thatch build up um, not with those blades of grass that are being cut because they're 80% uh, like I said about 80% water nitrogen it's not going to add to the thatch layer it's going to do nothing but in, in improve the health of your grass. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Andy. So glad you mentioned that, Andy. A couple of years ago, I used to run some slides and talk about mulching mowers. And the mower I used in the photo was my mower, and it had a bag on it. And people were like, "That has a bag on it." Well, it's a dual mower, so you can set it to mulch, or you can do set it to uh, to, to pick up the grass. So uh, uh, I, I do love the mulching mowers, uh, especially the dual mode. Uh, they, they work just great. Hey, for our uh, landscape contractors joining us, a lot of them probably already know this, but also for the professional homeowners, the, the, um, there's a little trick, you know, this is a, a Valley Crest trick. When we would uh, do any type of pruning of shrubs near grass, we would, we would drop all the clippings right there on the grass and come by with a large skag or walker with a mulching deck on it. And we would mulch the, uh, the leaves, the, 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 pr the clippings, whatever it was, run those through the mower and just mulch those right into the lawn. And it was a great way to reduce, uh, to reduce uh, uh, debris haul off as well. And uh, you, you 
you know, if you did it right, you wouldn't even notice the difference. And it, it, Hey, and save on some compost or some mulch for those areas too, you know, go ahead and edge and blow it into your lawn before you mow. This is the, uh, the smartest way to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of mulch and compost and all that, so leaf debris, uh, cleanup of, of uh, debris around your, your landscape. Um, you know, it's uh, depending on the part of the country you're in, you know, you're, you're deep in leaf fall right now or it's just starting, but uh, it's a good time of year to get that cleaned up in the fall. Um, yeah, grass nearby, a great way to pick it up is uh, use your lawnmower to either bag it um, or mulch it into the lawn. I've got a, uh, one of my favorite little tools, the blower um, with a vacuum attachment. So I can, I can blow all the leaves up to into a pile and then turn the thing around and vacuum all the leaves up and it goes through like a shredder and, and it puts it into a bag, I'll shred it up. And then I've got a little spot in my backyard. I, I dumped the, the, the shredded leaves on and uh, you can see in, in a few months, I've got, uh, I've got compost. Um, and, and I've also done this where I've added it to the compost pile and let it pile up there, or um, I'll just spread it throughout some of the beds just as a, uh, as a, a top dressing layer of, of mulch. So you compost, uh, add it in the spring or, or add it now, either way works great, but it's, it's amazing uh, what a, a little organic material does to the uh, biological activity of the soil. Okay, so once again, Andy, you've really helped me out here. I've not used a uh, vacuum shredder or a blower vacuum. What a great idea. I love that. And I love, uh, yeah, taking that shredded leaf material, adding it to my compost pile and uh, help me be ready for spring. That's for sure. Yeah, I typically can take you know, what would be maybe four or five plastic bags full of leaves and uh, after, you know, that about that quantity and reduce it to maybe three quarters to half a bag of uh, once it's been, it's, it's been through there and um, uh, a little, put it in a pile, add a little bit of water. And then my nine-year-old son and the neighborhood boys know that in, when they're in the backyard playing football or jumping on a trampoline, rather than coming inside to use the bathroom, that's what the compact, the compost pile is uh, just, just keep that moist. And that, that, that is a little uh, permaculture for, for those of you out there. <laughs> but composting all the way. Uh, along with cleaning up, uh, pruning, a great time of year to do some pruning. Um, first thing we wanna focus on uh, is anything that's dead, broken, or diseased. And I'll, and I'll say if it's diseased, don't put it in the compost pile, get rid of it. That's gotta be thrown away. It'll just spread diseased that way. Um, but uh, dead and broken, um, Maybe maybe uh, as the leaves start to fall, you see some some summer storm damage that needs to be taken care of. Um, you can get some of that done. The one thing I will say on trees when it comes to pruning, the rule of thumb I've always had is you never want to prune them when the leaves are budding or when they're falling. So you want to wait uh, to do any type of heavy pruning. Wait for uh, your deciduous trees to be in full dormancy. And uh, it's, you know, that, that's where you can get in there and do some structural pruning. Like, you know, light pruning would be, wouldn't be bad, but uh, structural pruning, uh, wait for the, the, uh, the leaves to have fully fallen. And depending on the, the, the part of the country you're in, that can change. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, fall can, can be a, uh, like a second spring. I think you see a, uh, a lot of plant material um, get a, uh, another, another uh, a burst of growth. And so the, uh, um, that can be a busy time of year for, for, for pruning shrubs as well. And then um, when it comes to perennials and your bloomers, uh, this kind of requires a little bit of a uh, um, deeper understanding of what you have. The first thing you want to understand is, the, is, is your bloom cycle of your plant. Um, some will do really well with a, a good cut back in the fall. Some you may want to wait. Uh, if it's a fall bloomer, especially you want to wait till it's bloomed. Um, so, uh, there's a, there's a book I have, uh, I think it's called perennials for every purpose. It's an encyclopedia of different types of perennials. It'll, you can use a great resource for figuring out, um, uh, when you should prune. Um, it's, it's, it's with perennials, uh, fall's a good time to divide those up. They get, uh, a little bit too large. You can, uh, divide them up and replant them in the yard or gift them to friends or, uh, 
Um, but it's a good time to do that. Um, you know, I talked about rejuvenation pruning. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's in essence clearing out dead leaves, tired, kind of, you know, overgrown stuff. You see this being very beneficial for ornamental grasses, cutting those back hard. But there's other perennials as well that a hard cutback um, will, uh, will, do, will serve them well. And it makes way for new growth. And then again, depending on where you live in the country, some of that 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 mulch or compost you have, you may want to cover the uh, those perennials with that to protect them from any hard frosts, so they're not fully exposed. So again, Andy, did the key here is wait till after they bloom? Yeah, yeah, and under, understand the bloom cycle. That's the that's probably the simplest takeaway is understand the bloom cycle. It's uh, no different than in springtime, if you have a spring blooming perennial, you don't, you want to wait till after it blooms to prune it. Yeah. So for those of us in warmer climates, we may have a bloom, like you say, in the, in the fall and just, just wait, be patient. Yes. Yeah. Understand the cycle. And you know, it's funny with perennials. I mean, hot Western exposure, cool, full shade. I mean, there are perennials that grow in every, you know, everything in between and uh, each one's gonna be treated differently. And so it really, really pays to do your homework, understand what you're working with so you can. Yeah, great point, Andy, thank you. So, you know, we mentioned this earlier with grass, uh, with turf, turf grass, lawns, that the cool air and warm soil stimulates a lot of root growth. Because of that, fall then becomes a, not a great time, but the best time to plant trees and shrubs. Um, soil moisture in the soil is going to be uh, better regulated. And because of the, uh, the, the low ET, that's the evapotranspiration, not only, and the ET is lower not only because the temperatures are cooler, but because the day lengths are shorter as well. And that's probably the biggest impact on how much uh, water a, a plant needs or the day lengths, because those hours of sunshine are shorter, um, days are cooler, trees don't need as much water, so you better, better uh, moisture management. Um, but when that, that soil is warm, those roots are really stimulated to grow better, and it's just like a perfect growing condition. And the benefit is that tree, that shrub can get established before the high winds in the spring or, you know, summer heat can really, uh, it, it, we talk about transplant shock, before the transplant shock can affect some of these. So it becomes uh, October, typically is the best time to plant a tree. Um, diagram here that I borrowed from the International Society of Arboriculture, a couple things to, to look at here, you know, the old rule of thumb, always uh, dig a hole at least twice as wide as the root ball, but no deeper. You don't wanna, you don't wanna bury the tree. That, that flare, trunk flare should never be below the soil level. Uh, the container it came in has got to be removed. I know, you know, it makes sense if you have a, a plastic container, but burlap, people think, oh, the burlap's going to uh, rot. You got to remove it. <laughs> it'll, it'll bind up those roots. Um, soil amendments, eh, it depends. It, it depends on um, uh, where you're at. Um, a lot of uh, trees that are already adapted to your area won't need amendments, but um, if, you're, if you're growing in really poor soil, organic material is always a great way to, uh, to improve that. Um, and I will say something about staking. Um, trees typically come with a nursery stake, and those stakes have got to be removed. That is an absolute necessity. And I'll also say if uh, you remove that nursery stake and the tree falls over, throw it in the compost pile, that tree's no good. Uh, or take it back to the nursery. Now, or you know, like me, before I ever bought a tree, I'd go around the nursery cutting the ties off the nursery stakes. If they bent over, like, no, nope, that one's no good, but they stand on their own. Yeah, that, that's good. That's a sign of a higher quality tree. And, and then, you have a question that just oh, came in from a viewer and, and yeah. they're asking how many nurseries have you been thrown out of? Ah, none. <laughs> none. No. I, I, I do that with a nursery representative. We'll walk okay. through there. Yeah, you got it. Um, and that's, yeah, with them as well, you pull a tree out of the pot and look at the roots, make sure it's not pot, pot bound. Um, uh, but yeah, any, 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 any quality nursery would uh should, should be fine with that if, if they're not doing that already on their own yeah great point it is a good practice and and uh i also you know know about that uh the root uh, boundness and pulling them out of the pot and 
I hardly see anybody do that, but uh, the nursery people are completely fine with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's funny is uh, uh, I go to these uh, classes for uh, to, to maintain my our, um, our boriculture CEUs, a certified arborist, and uh, there are nursery representatives in those same classes hearing the same things that, you know, the rest of us are hearing. So it's something they expect. Um, speaking of stakes, though, so removing the nursery stake, yes, that's the stake that goes right up against the trunk of the tree. It causes all sorts of problems, but you do want to come back and uh, stake the trees. You can see in this di diagram, uh, two stakes on either side of the tree. The purpose of these stakes is not to hold the tree up, it's to stabilize the root ball. Uh, because if that root ball and winds rocks too much, it could potentially break the root. So you want to stabilize that root ball, let the roots grow out and the soil become established. And then after one year, you can take those stakes off. But sole purpose of staking is to stabilize the root ball, not to hold the tree up. So. Yeah. So about one year, keep them on there a year, take them off. I, like I said, I see so many people leave them on forever almost. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't help the plant really. Or the tree. It does. And in fact, it can damage it. It, it can uh, girdle the trunk. It can, it can, it can rub the bark off it can be an entry for disease or insect, um, uh, you know, damage. So, so, yeah. And then to top it off, uh, every, plant every the trees especially a nice a nice layer of mulch around that uh around the tree well is uh is a good addition and it looks it looks great and it does a lot of a lot of benefit too like a fresh coat of paint i always say yes yes <laughs> and then uh, fall is also a great time to uh add some color uh, colored pots of color but annuals annuals are a great addition to the, uh, the the fall landscape as well and you can do uh, all sorts of fun things but uh, a splash of color um, is is always is always a welcome sight too yeah very welcoming up on your front doorstep or entry to the home I like that yeah, yeah you get a lot of fun with it so uh, speaking of mulch though uh, fall is a great time to add mulch to your landscape. And that can be organic mulch or aggregate. And by aggregate mulch, I mean river rocks, decorative rock, decomposed granite, you know, that, that kind of thing. And it's amazing, uh, while the aggregate mulch may not decompose and add uh, nutrition and stuff to the soil, it does help the soil. Number one, it prevents um, evaporation. But uh, I've noticed here in the desert, if I pick up a rock, even on a hot summer day, it's moist underneath. And there's little, you know, organic growth underneath that rock, like little mycelium. I mean, it, it supports a, uh, some, some of the, those, the, the, the growing of some of these organic, uh, these beneficial things in the soil. So it, it, it doesn't, um, does improve uh, soil structure as well. So organic or aggregate mulch, uh, absolute must, I'd say throughout the landscape. Fall is a good time to add new. If you have uh, never added it before, three to four inches uh, is a good depth. If you have it, but it's looking a little bit tired, needs to be refreshed, about a one inch cover um, is a great way to spruce up your yard. And, and uh, you know, there's so many things going on in spring and summer. Um, fall and winter become a great time to, uh, to, to do some of those, uh, the, the mulch applications. So. Uh, benefits I've, I've, I've listed here, regulates temperature, improves uh, moisture retention, uh, reduces evaporation, improves the soil structure. Um, if you have, we talked about perennials, covering some of those with mulch. If you've cut those back, it can protect tender plants from the ravages of winter, uh, suppresses weeds, controls erosion, and, and at the end of the day, it just it looks nice. And landscape is all about aesthetics. Yeah, and I can't help it, Andy. I agree. It looks so great. And what I'm also seeing is you're moving spray heads way away from the building. So they're not uh, impacting what's happening on the side of the building or the foundation. Uh, you can put drip irrigation in here. No, no problem. And uh, man, uh, great aesthetically and great function. So I love it when uh, function and aesthetics uh, come together and look so well. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and speaking of aesthetics versus function, you know, you could buy, um, dyed uh, ground up trees or you know wood wood chips that have been dyed a uh, certain color and those look nice um, I would say wood chips absolutely are great bark isn't as great it, it doesn't have as many benefits as as wood chips would um, 
but if uh, if you don't care so much about the color and you, uh, you know, if you have a contact at a tree company in your town, you know, they're running these tree trimmings and, and trees are removing through their chippers they're creating wood mulch and or wood chips. And a lot of times they have to pay to dispose that they'll, uh, a lot of these companies, these ones that I know are, will give it away for free. So if you just wanted something in your yard and, and it can look nice, it's got a blonde look to it. It doesn't have that dyed look, but um, if you, if you're on a budget or you maybe you don't, uh, maybe you like that look, uh, that's a great way to, uh, to, uh, to add, uh, something very beneficial to your landscape with, uh, the, the only thing it requires is a little bit of, uh, a uh, little sweat equity. Yeah. It's interesting to me too, because I see different trends catching on in different places. If you've been to Sacramento in the last few years, you'll notice that they love black mulch there. Um, they, they think it really helps the grass to pop and you see that green grass better with a black mulch. Other parts of the country, you don't see it at all. It's kind of interesting to see these trends in, uh, in mulch. Yeah. I've gotten into habit the past, oh man, this has probably been the past eight years or so. Uh, we have a program here in Southern Nevada where they set up these Christmas tree recycling stations throughout the city. You drop off your Christmas tree and they take them over to, uh, I don't know, big chippers set up and they and they shred it but they have these piles of uh of, of mulch and and uh i've been i've been grabbing that and I'll, I'll use that around my yard and in areas where where i want it to look nice i'll i'll, I'll grab a bag of, of maybe compost if i don't have my own I'll, I'll buy a bag and just put a little bit of that on top to to darken it up but once I get, once you get that established, I could go out to uh, the stuff I put down last year. It's already turned black, and and uh, it, it it really decomposes quite quickly. It looks nice, and uh, and it you know you could, you could add a little bit of black uh, compost on top of that. But the real benefit is right after I install it, you know, especially around the backyard, if we're out on the patio, it smells like uh, Christmas trees. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> but, Christmas year round. Now. Yeah. Um, we did have a viewer who very kindly put into the chat uh, a web address, getchipdrop.com. It's a location to connect arborists with gardeners who want to use uh, wood chips for mulch. So thanks very much for putting that in the chat. And uh, boy, check that out. That'd be interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, fall is another good time to, to tune up your irrigation system. And I'll talk specifically on, on drip here um, again because uh, days are cooler water needs are less it's a good time to, to make some of these improvements first and foremost uh, reduce your irrigation typically one time per week if at all is going to be uh, necessary even when you have warmer temperatures again it's, it's not so much the temperature as it is the day length the days are shorter water needs are less um, but with that said don't forget to water I know you guys will turn out their their uh, sprinklers all winter long, and uh, that that can that can be damaging as well. Um, maybe the easiest way to do this is invest in a, a a smart controller that tells you when when to water based on the weather. But uh, you know, rule of thumb, one time per week. Um, and if it's in it, would it, around here anyway, in the Southwest, uh, there's probably three or four weeks out of the winter you can completely turn it off, or you get you get enough rains or freezing temperatures where the, uh, there's the water is holding in the soil. So reducing frequency is number one. Number two, it's a great time of year to get out, inspect your system, look for cracks, look for leaks, look for breaks. Um, because you've been doing all this pruning and clean up around your plants, it's a good time to see the drip emitters when the, when the shrubs are full and leaves are on and everything. You, sometimes it's hard to see the emitter, see if it's working. Well, once you get those cleaned up, you got the leaves blown out, you can see those emitters. Turn the system on, inspect it, make sure they're working, make sure they're not plugged up. Um, it's a great time of year too. Let's say you planted a tree last year and it's, it's starting to grow. You need to expand your, your irrigation system. Uh, fall's a great time to do that. You know, get over to the valve box, um, inspect the wires, uh, inspect those connections, uh, take the filter out. Um, <laughs> this may be the only time of year people look at it, but <laughs> to, you know, pull your filter apart, uh, clean it, you know, empty the debris basin and, um, flush the system as well, either through a, uh, manually, we've, we've talked about this in other webinars, uh, automatic flush valves, like the one that Jane makes, or a manual flush, but get that drip system flushed out, 
any debris that's built up inside there through hard water or, or whatever, uh, get that flushed out. Um, a great time of year to do that. And then the last thing I'll say, if you live in, a, in an area where it freezes, um, you know, the, the easiest way to, uh, for your drip system anyway, is go to where you're flushing, open that up, let, let the water drain out, and um, you won't have to worry about uh, uh, blowing the lines out like you do with PVC, uh, the, the, uh, the um, uh, polyethylene in your drip system. Um, it can handle a little bit of water there and it, and it freezes, but uh, uh, because you're flushing the system, if you're gonna, if you're gonna winterize it, um, leave that cap off and just let it drain. Yeah, great point, Sandy. And the other thing that I really like about working on my irrigation in the fall is when I'm working on it in the summer, I have this sense of urgency that if I make a mistake or if there's a problem, I'm going to lose plant material and I don't have that same sense of urgency or uh, I don't feel so anxious about it in the fall. I know I can spend a few days fixing something or if something goes wrong, I've got some time. And uh, usually that just makes things go a lot better. Mother nature is your friend in the fall. Let her help. All right. Uh, Next thing here, so you, you've worked all spring, all summer, and you've even gone through the fall using these tools. Um, you know, so much about our culture, we live in a throwaway culture. We use it until something's wrong with it, we throw it away. And um, that's not a very sustainable practice. And I think, you know, those of us who, who enjoy gardening or enjoy the landscape, I think uh, maybe we feel a bit more connection with the planet and sustainability becomes uh, something we care about. Um, you know, tools are, are something if, if cared for properly can last a long time. And, uh, you know, three key things for caring for your tools in the fall, you clean them, you know, get the mud off them, get the rust off them, um, debris built up, sharpen them. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times using a shovel, I've nicked it or, or, or cracked it or something, but taking a little file to a shovel, working those things out, and just, it doesn't have to be a sharp edge like a knife, but a little bit of an edge makes it easier to get into the soil. Um, later in the year, your, your pruning shears, um, uh, a nice file, you can, you can sharpen those up. Uh, um, putting a nice little edge on them is, is great. And then, uh, you know, um, a little oil on them, prevent, preventing the rust as they sit in the shed or garage over the fall and winter. And uh, I, I personally prefer, I've used WD-40 just, you know, as, you know, if I've, I've used my little Corona hand shears out in the landscape and they're covered in water, um, I'll spray them WD-40 and, you know, it's just water displacement for Formula 40, right? That works well. But recently when it comes to like winterizing tools, I've been, uh, I've been using boiled linseed oil and I use it on the wood handle tools. I scrape off the old, uh, the, uh, the lacquer that comes on there when they're brand new. And every fall, I'll wipe some boiled linseed oil and that keeps the wood from drying out and from cracking. And then, you know, how many times you picked up a wood sh uh, shovel or, or rake or pick or whatever it was, and the wood is dry and you go to use it and you get a splinter, you know, big fat splinter driven through your hand because uh, the wood wasn't conditioned. So boiled linseed oil is great for that. And I'll take that same rag I used on the wood and I'll wipe it over the face of the tools as well. And it's a great way of uh, preventing rust. So, uh, you know, a little bit of maintenance on your tools and uh, there's no reason why they won't last uh, um, as long as your landscape lasts. So clean, uh, clean, sharpen and oil are the name of the game with your tools. Great tip, Sandy. And, you know, I'm a big Corona tool user as well. Chris Savarisi and the whole team over there at Corona do such a great job. Um, you know, I'm a tool nut and uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, my shovels last uh, 10 years plus and I actually want a new one, right? Just to see what's out. But uh, yeah, <laughs> keep them clean and care for them and they'll last forever. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a pair of Corona uh, hand shears, hand pruners that I got in 2004 when I first started with Valley Crest. I still have that same pair. The little, the little uh, latch that holds them together is long gone, but uh, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, a slow day around the house on the weekends in the winter, you know, it's, it's fun to take out a file and get that thing razor sharp. And, you know, it's, it makes such a difference cutting with a sharp tool than it does a dull tool. 
and really reduces hand fatigue. And as you get uh, you know a little bit older and been working with your hands all your life, that, that makes a big difference <laughs> at the end of the day. And a sharp tool will reduce your fatigue. So yeah, well said. And uh, that's that's all I got for you guys today. That's uh, that was a lot, actually, Andy. A really good job with this information. And uh, fortunately for all of us, uh, the weekend's about to start. So uh, if you didn't have something to do this weekend, uh, Andy's, I hope you get a great start. Um, <laughs> we do have one viewer who had one last question, and uh, it's one of our favorite viewers too. He wants to know what was the brand name of the cough drops you used to get it uh, when you were trick or treating, not on Halloween. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea, but I remember telling my mom as a kid, yeah, Miss, I can't remember her name. She was like 80 back then. She gave us cough drops. We can't wait to go back. And I thought my mom was going to fall out of her chair. She gave you yep. what? Yeah. Medicine? <laughs> scaring parents all over the place right now so anyway andy thanks so much uh really enjoyed your presentation learned a lot as usual so thank you thank you to our viewers for checking in uh, we really appreciate that i also want to mention that um all our trainings are at uh, janesusa.com forward slash trainings they're all there for free many of them um uh, qualify for ceus for the irrigation association I know it's the end of the year and people are looking for ways to uh, get some credits, educational credits, and they're there for you uh, 24 hours a day for free. Uh, next week, uh, we hope you're back on Wednesday. You know, uh, Michael Derwenko has done some presentations on landscape photography that were really good. And I've said to him later on, I said, you know, after I have these photos, what if I want to print them out? What if I want to frame them? How do I do all this? I really want to show off some nice uh, nice things in my office, uh, some nice landscapes I've seen. How do I do this? He's going to answer that for us on Wednesday and give us some great tips and tricks to uh, be able to actually print and uh, display uh, your, your nice photos. So anyway, Andy, thanks again. Uh, appreciate everybody's time. Don't forget, you can listen to us also uh, anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, check us out there too. So thanks everybody. We'll see you later. Thanks guys. Bye.